Hello, I'm Harper. I'm Natter. And we're from Rev.dev. And I'm going to walk you through how to fine-tune Mistral 7B on your own data set. You might have seen the video that we posted. Okay, so Harper fine-tuned Mistral 7B on her own data, uh, on her journal, and it was hilarious. The notebook was super well-received, so I figured I would just walk you through it. Hey, we're ready to go through the notebook. We're here on the GitHub page. We have the Jupyter notebook pulled up. Um, as I say, I did this for just $1 using a brev.gpu and then some of the intro. We're going to use QLaura, which is a fine tuning method that um, helps reduce, you know, the size of the model and allows you to fine tune on a smaller GPU, which is what we do here. And so you can read more about how QLaura works in the linked post uh, right here. We're also going to be using GEFT to, uh, for the LoRa. Let's begin. And so to start, we want to have our data prepared. And so I'm not going to show you what my data looks like because it's my personal journal. But what I did was I um, exported the data from my Apple Notes using um, an app called Exporter, which apparently runs locally on your device and doesn't send any data there. I actually turned off my Wi-Fi when I was using it just to be cautious. It's nothing bad, but it's like my journal. Um, and yeah, so I put it into this format. This is like the typical input output format, but you actually don't need that because what we're actually going to be doing is just training like a, a token predictor, basically. Like we're not going to train in on input output pairs. We're actually just going to train it on inputs that are just like one longer string. You'll see the input um, or the training data soon. But to start, we just need to get our nodes in this format. And so I used this exporter and then I also use ChatGPT to get it into this format. So I just asked ChatGPT like, oh, I have my data in this format. I think exporter put it into a single .txt file for each note. So I told ChatGPT, look, I have this directory of um, notes that are formatted as like note one, note two, note three .txt. Please go through this directory and for each note append it onto one file, this one .jsonl file in the format like quote note and then quote the rest of the note um, and then have it like in uh, parentheses like in a, a map format but with just note as the one key. And so it did that for me and the notebook worked well. I recommend, you know, asking it to create the notebook for you in a, in a language that you're comfortable with so that you can debug pretty easily. So once you have your data in this format, we're gonna have to load the data set on a GPU. I use a GPU from Rev.dev. And as I say, the whole thing cost me $1. The A10G is 24 gigabyte memory. Um, those are a dollar an hour. So yeah, I was able to do this in about an hour. I had about 200 total examples. Yes, yeah, so I actually didn't train on that many examples, but it worked really well. Okay, cool. So let's click here for the one click deploy of the model of the machine. So we'll just let it load. So see it opens an A10G, it opens the smallest one, it's a dollar an hour. Um, and we can set the storage to just be typical storage. I wouldn't recommend getting a spot instance because you don't want to lose the GPU while it's training. Um, and then yeah, it's pretty name. So let's just click deploy. Obviously I was signed into Brev already, but um, you might have to make an account. This is going to start and then we're going to want to build on three. I used Python 3.10 and CUDA 12.0.1. So it's already preset. Um, and then we can just click build. And so this will take a few minutes to get the GPU all set up for you so that you don't have to worry about anything. So just give this a few minutes and then come back. Okay, cool. So now we can see that it's all running and it's configured. So we want to click the notebook button. And this will bring us to our Jupyter Lab where we can upload our notebook. So let's just download this. It's downloaded and then I want to upload it here. Let's just rename it. Cool. And so now we have our notebook. All right. So now we want to install all the requirements. Oh, it looks like I actually used CUDA 11.7, but, and I installed 12.0.1, but I think it should be okay. And if it doesn't, then I'll just redo this whole thing. Okay, cool. So it's done running. So let's load the next one. So we need to get our data. We want to split it. Ah, see, I have an issue because I haven't uploaded my notes and my notes validation files. So I split the examples into a, you know, 80-20 split, um, where 80% went into one, file and 20% went into this notes validation file. So now we just need to upload it. And so here we are, we want to add the notes validation. And then we also want oops, to add that notes. Oh, geez. Cool. And so now let's try running this again. Cool. It worked. So now we're in the formatting prompts, uh, in the 
place where we get the formatting function to format our prompts. And so this is the formatting function that I used. I said the following. So for each example, it says the following note is a note by Evie the dog. And I gave it this identifier so that it's really clear to the model later when I'm prompting it to write in a certain style. So when I'm prompting it later, I'll say, you know, the following is a note by Evie the dog that talks about this or that does this. Um, and then it knows to, to talk like that, like my notes. And here's a pretty standard formatting function, kind of what um, matched uh, this input output that I talked about at the beginning, that format for the data. And so if you want to do something like that um, and use this kind of formatting function, you can do that as well. So now we're going to load the base model. So this is where we load Mistral 7B, which is really great. It outperforms Llama um, 2, 7B, 13B on all tested benchmarks. So yeah, it's going to take a few minutes to load it. We're going to load it in 4-bit quantization. So we see we have this BNB config, bits and bytes config, which is where we quantize, we can quantize the model. So see, it takes this quantization config and we're going to load it in 4-bit. So what that does is it like shrinks each of the float sizes. And I talk about this when I discuss QLora, but it makes all the float sizes, I think they were like 32. Or, I mean, 16. Now they're four bits. So as you can imagine, it's way smaller. And so that we can we can load the model on a smaller machine with, with less memory. However, the, it is lossy, obviously, like of a floating point. As you re reduce precision, you're going to lose some of that data. Um, so just be aware that it may not, you know, perform as well out of the box, but it's supposed to be um, pretty, pretty close. Cool. So now we've loaded the model and now we can get to tokenization. And so what we're going to do is we're going to want to tokenize our data, the input data from notes validation and notes. And so we're going to, and we're going to want to pad on the left uh, because that is one of the um, things that you want to do with this type of model. And we want to add an end of sentence token and also a before beginning of sentence token. So this is just how we want to do it. And they want the pad token to be the end of sentence token. Sometimes there's, it's, there are their own pad tokens, but um, I think Mistral uses the end of sentence token as a padding token, and that's been increasingly common. So I'm just going to go with that. Okay, so here we, we're going to use a data loader and load it, and we're mapping this train data set. We're going to run this function, so tokenize off the data, and then we have this tokenized train and valid data set. And next, what I do here is I want to I plot the distribution of length. And so what we're trying to get here is like a max input length. And so we don't do any padding at first. Um, we're going to want to pad the inputs so that they are all the same length when they go into the model because it's, you know, it's matrix multiplications. And so you need them all to, you know, fit together into a matrix. And so we have to pad many of them so that they're all the same length and often truncate some as well. And so I want to graph the distribution of lengths here. So 512 is a pretty common length and I also like manually went through and cut some really long ones out because I don't want to truncate too much because some of the longer ones are actually some of my you know better inputs into the model and so what I did before when I was creating the data set was I went through and I found the ones that were really long and you could do that here right well like when you create this distribution of length if you see that there are some that are super long like even so here there's still some that are really long you can go through and like cut them or I wouldn't necessarily like um, write a script to cut them. I guess you could, you could say like, you know, if it's at the end of a sentence, I like to go in and make sure like all the context was contained in one note. So like, you know, so my journal entries, I'll write about one part of my life and then, you know, in a new paragraph, I'll write about another part of my life. And so I just wanted, I went through and just made sure that all the com contexts were encompassed because I cared um, about having that context for the model when it was outputting it. But if you're just, you know, training on like a way of speaking, you're not so worried about it being like, you know, coherent with certain types of context that may not matter to you as much. And so you can cut it, but I probably wouldn't cut it like mid sentence because we are adding this end of sentence token and this beginning of sentence token. And so if you cut in the middle of a sentence, um, that's going to be confusing for the model because it's going to retain, the, it's going to get this input that's like, oh, this is the beginning of a sentence, but it's going to be in the middle of a sentence. Or it's going to, you know, say this is the end of a sentence, but it's going to be halfway through a word. So, yeah, I would just be cautious on how you're doing it. But here I cut it up already and 512 seems to work for me. 
I'll get most of the data. Some of it will be cut. It's the way it goes. If I wanted to do more data ma manipulation, I could. Okay, so here I'm setting max length to be 12. And so let's just run that. And we're going to truncate it. The padding is max length padding. All right, so let's run it again. We'll generalize into a nice prompt function. And so we just want to check that it starts with the padding token, which is two, then inside this token. It, then it has a beginning of sentence token, and then it ends with an end of sentence token. Cool. It looks good. Okay, cool. So they're all the same length. That's what we want to see. And so optionally, we can see how the base model does. And so this is a good example of like an eval prompt. For example, if you have health scores, you could run this one. But this is the one that I use, which is the following is no by eating the dog. Okay, so now we're gonna we're gonna run it through this tokenizer. So we're gonna tokenize the input, and here we see that we are not using padding or an end of sentence token because it's not the end of the sentence. Um, and so this is the output of the original model. This is not the way I speak. <laughs> okay, so moving on to Laura. Now we want to load the Laura, which is the low rank adapter, so adaptation. This function basically. We're printing the model, what it looks like, what the layers look like. And just, I'm printing it so that you can see the difference. Oh, and I also print it so that we can apply Laura to all the linear layers. So see, I grab all the linear layers. Um, so here we define the Laura config. And so R is the rank of the low rank, rank matrix used by the adapters. Um, and so it controls the number of parameters trained. And so a higher rank will allow for more expressivity, but there is a huge trade-off. And alpha is the scaling factor for the layered weights. So the weight matrix is scaled by alpha over R. And so a higher value of alpha assigns more weight to the LoRa activations. So the values I saw in the paper in uh, 64 and 16 for rank and alpha respectively. But it's actually pretty common with fine tuning to use alpha, which is double the rank. So that's what we're doing here. And I still maintain a relatively high amount of expressivity, but not like too much for the compute trade-off. And the dropout is pretty standardly 0.05. So I leave that. And then now you can see like how much longer the model is. And you can see the, so like here we have Q proj, K proj, E proj. Um, and that's where we apply Laura. And then here, Q proj has turned into this whole thing. And K projects turned into this whole thing. And so, yeah, we've applied Laura. Um, now we want to set up the accelerator. As I say, I'm not sure if this is helpful um, given QR's description, but I feel like it can't hurt. And then this is setting up weights and biases. So this just helps if you want to view, you know, the loss curve and it just does all of that for you. So you don't have to implement it yourself, which is quite nice. So I'm just going to click this and authorize. Cool. Now we're ready to run training. And this will parallelize if we have more than one GPU. Um, I'm currently only using one. That length that I gave you only used one. So yeah. Um, and then here's the training. And so it's running. And I'm just going to walk you through what some of these are. So every 25 steps, we save a checkpoint. And you can load a model from a checkpoint. So it saves everything that you need to load the model later. So if you notice, when I say here in this note on fine tuning, is if you notice that you know the model performs best, at, you know, uh, epoch, you know, 525, then you can load that model from there and you can stop training early. You don't need to like train all the way to the end and then grab, just take the model from there. We want a small learning rate for fine tuning. And I found that this one works well for me. 2.5 over 10 to the fifth. I'm doing a math steps of 500. It's not too high. I don't have that much training data. So I don't really need to train it all that much. Um, per device train batch size, I'm using batch size of two. And I think as you, um, there is a relationship between the learning rate that you want and the batch size. And I think, I forget what I saw, but I think it might, you want a higher learning rate if you have a larger batch size. Every 25 steps I log so we can see the training loss and the validation loss at step 25 already. And then you can view the project here on weights and biases. And this is today. And so it's just started. Um, but yeah. And another note too is that I just talk about overfitting here. I found that I let my model overfit a little bit. So what overfitting means is when the validation loss is a little bit 
higher or significantly higher than the trading loss. And so when you have that, what you're doing is you're basically having the models fit around the trading data. And so it kind of produces like a really elaborate curve or, so that it fits the trading data really well. But the problem with that is that it it doesn't generalize well to the test data or the validation data. That could be a problem if you're trying to like deploy a model and you have all different types of inputs that it's going to receive. But for me, since I'm kind of just like, I kind of just want it to output things that are very similar to my style and I'm just using this for myself and I'm not really testing like on new inputs. I'm okay with it kind of overfitting to my own personal like journals. So I'm okay with it. And I'm actually, I kind of like it. So I'm going to let that happen a little bit. A few minutes later. Okay, so we can see that it's really overfitting here. So this is a great example. See how the trading loss has gone down a lot, but the validation loss has gone up. It was kind of going down and then it promptly, you know, shot back up. So we can choose kind of what we want to do here. I guess this would probably be the best one for not overfitting. As I said, I'm okay with a little bit of overfitting. Let's go with this one. We'll see how it goes. So we can just stop this. Um, interrupt the kernel. And it'll get ugly and get mad at me because I interrupted it, but that's okay. And so now we're going to want to try the trained model. And so let's restart. We, so what we want to do is we want to load the base model and then we're going to put the LoRa checkpoint on top of it. So see, we have all these checkpoint files now and we're going to specify which one we want and that has the LoRa adapters. And so first we're going to load the base model again. See, Arlene, what did we forget? Token is required. Okay. So I need to do my hugging face login. So let's get a terminal here. Hugging face. Still I login. Hide token, yes. And then it wants me to run this again. And so then I just need to log in again. Now we can try running this again. And this will, okay, so my kernel died, oh, which means that I ran out of memory, which makes sense because I'm loading this other model on top of the one that we had before. So it would make sense. So let's just start over, um, but let's just we'll reload our instance. And so the way we can do that is in the Brev console. Let's just reboot it. And uh, we'll come back in a minute. And while this is going, we can just take a lo uh, look at the curve. So see, trading loss is going down, but the email loss is going up a lot. So yeah, it's overfitting. Cool. So I had to restart. And now we can load the model. And so we have the base ID, the bits and bytes config, and this is loading. It'll take a minute. Okay, cool. And so now we load the LoRa adapters. And so you put the checkpoint that you want right there. And I say repetition penalty. Um, let's see. Hopefully it's not too personal. <sighs> okay, yeah, it's kind of personal, but that's okay. Anyway, um, <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Um, please join our Discord. I want to get to know you. Um, feel free to reach out with questions on X. Discord is the best. Join our community. Really excited to meet you. And I hope that this was helpful and informative and really cool so i i hope you have a model that talks like you or you know it's just fine-tuned on whatever data you want to fine-tune it on and i hope you enjoy so until next time i'm harper from brev.dev and i will see you soon bye